Welcome back to Beautiful Work, Beautiful Life. We have Pixie back in the house with us as promised so we could do this other part of our communication topic that we didn't get to last time. And I'm going to announce it right from the beginning so that we can just reel right into it, which is rewriting your narrative. And we have some really great content for you, some really great ideas. So get out your pen, get out your paper, get ready to write. Here we go. Where do you want to start, ladies? (laughs) Welcome back, Pixie. Thank you for coming back. Yeah. So nice to have you again, Pixie. Thank you. I love being here. Good, good. Well, so let's start with, um, here's what I would like to talk. Let's just talk about this whole idea of your narrative. So, uh, because I do feel like it's kind of a jargon buzzword kind of thing now, you know, Um, like we all have our narrative and we're sticking to it kind of thing. And so I don't want people to think that um, we're just coming from that place with it. I really want people to, you know, our listeners to know, like, this is really about, I I mean, one of the titles I liked was taking charge of your narrative, because I do feel like this is the time where when you recognize that you just went through an experience and you don't like the way you showed up, you don't like what you said, you don't like the way a conversation played out this is where we're going with it to help you work on, do the inner work and do the self-reflection so that you can next time when you are encountering a similar situation, which you will, we always do that. You're going to be more prepared to show up the way you want to say the things you want to say, say them well, things like this, right? Yeah. I love that because I do think sometimes we show up and then at at least I do this I critique, you know, af- after the fact, right? I I, yeah. I watch the playback in my head yeah. um, and I critique myself. And so by looking at how I handled something, I'm often able to think about how how would I rather have, right? And we, we know we can't have a do-over in the moment, mm-hmm. right? But prepping for next time is really good. Yeah. That's really what yeah, I think I think that's the blessing in all of this is that we we're not erasing the experience. Right. Um, a lot of times when people think, oh, I'm going to rewrite my narrative, I'm going to rewrite my past. Well, no, you're you're really not. You're going to uh, you're going to embrace the past and and uh, kind of rewrite the experience so that it kind of feels better and prepare for the next opportunity, because as we all know, there's there's going to be a a next opportunity. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I remember this topic with Laurel one time. I um, went over to her house and um, I was really kind of annoyed. And um, she's like, well, what's what's going on? And I told her about a, a conversation I had with a friend And as Laurel said, you know, I was beating myself up for it and self-sabotaging and, you know, what I did say, what I didn't say. And um, and I noted also that it happens a lot with this particular friend, what was bothering me and how the conversation went. And Laurel just kind of, you know, as she usually does, raises this profound but seemingly simple offhanded question of, so how would you rewrite that phone conversation and create a new memory in its place? Mm. And I was just, you know, stumped. I was, <laughs> wow, that's, mm. that's a really, really good question. And so together, I think together we did it, Laurel. Yeah. We, re- we reframed the conversation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, of course, the important question that was, guiding the conversation was, you know, how did it make me feel and what would I have done or needed to do differently to make me feel another way? You know, whether it's setting boundaries or remaining silent or speaking my truth or whatever it was. Yeah. And um, I remember it was a it was a it was a a opportunity together with a trusted friend (laughs) to get very conscious Um, instead of going into conversations robotically and and habitually and 
which I did uh, often with this particular friend. Um, I envisioned and imagined kind of a new new outcome. Mm -hmm. And um, after we did it, Laurel, I remember feeling so energized, like Mm -hmm. I had my power back. I could visualize the next conversation with this particular friend. I, I, I saw the whole thing. I imagined it going differently in kind of like a non habitual manner, you know, calm, thoughtful, bringing my authentic self to it. And, um, and, and, and it worked because I, I rewrote that narrative, created a new one for the next opportunity that was assuredly going to happen with this friend. And what, what's so funny, I can't remember what year that was, Laurel. It might have been, I don't know, four years ago. I, yeah. I'm not sure, but yeah. the bit, the bottom line, the blessing in this is it was an absolute turning point in this relationship. Absolute. Yeah different relationship yeah. um I showed up differently and now she shows up differently and as a result it's honest it's trusting it's open it's um it's equal it's two-way it's wonderful yeah amen you know and this is why um this practice that we're talking about today is so powerful because a lot of times we feel like you know we're stuck in And in repeat conversations with people or that we are repeating the same kind of issues or stuck in the same quality of conversation um, with people. And and they might be people that we really love and we don't want to end the relationship. We have no desire to end the relationship, but we do know that there's something that needs to change. We just know that, you know, it doesn't feel good. And so the, 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 so let's just break down a little bit, Pixie, like some of the, I want to talk about some of the specifics that you said as you were describing, you know, what you did. So one of the things was using your imagination to be in a different place in that conversation with somebody, right? When we're rewriting the script, what we're really doing is using our imagination because we don't know, we, you know, we don't know until we do it, how it's actually going to go. So we're imagining a different way of being and a different way of speaking that we might not be accustomed to. And then we actually write the words down or practice the words out loud because they're not necessarily familiar or comfortable. Well, I think, I actually think there's a step before the imagination. And, mm-hmm. and I think the, the first step is awareness of how you feel. Yeah. And, and obviously it's probably not a good feeling. Yeah. You know, you're probably feeling bad. And like Laurel suggested, like we all do, then you go into this kind of self-sabotage. What did I do wrong? You mm-hmm. know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I think actually the first step is awareness of what of what you're feeling. But then the second one is compassion for yourself in that experience yeah. in in the hold yourself with compassion no judgment because i think the compassion starts the inner dialogue that's needed before the the next dialogue the compassion oh, yeah. is yeah. yeah that's what starts the inner dialogue and brings the ultimate peace so then i think once you realize okay i'm feeling Oh, gosh, I'm feeling so bad. I'm feeling so mad. I'm I'm mad at myself. I'm mad at her. I'm get it all out, and yeah. then just say, okay, okay, it's okay. I'm okay. This happens. This is human. This is what relationships are all about. Let's breathe, and <laughs> now let's start imagining it differently. Yeah. I think, yeah. 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 And I love that you brought up Pixie, the, the, the emotion, the feeling of, of, you know, the feelings, right. The emotions, because I think sometimes when we rewrite the script or we imagine how we would rather show up than what we did uh, or how we showed up um, that the, to me, whenever I imagine a, a different, you know, behavior, it comes with far less emotion and maybe not less emotion, but I have more um, awareness and I'll say control of my emotion, right? So I, I often imagine how do I want to feel in this relationship? How do I want to feel when I speak these words, right? What is the emotion 
that I want to carry into this. And and controlling my emotion doesn't mean not showing emotion. It means maybe better managing my emotion, not letting my emotion manage me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or the conversation. Right. Yeah. 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 And it's not that we're not going to be emotional or can't show or demonstrate emotion. It's really just having hopefully worked it through enough that the emotion doesn't derail your ability to feel like you're, you're proceeding in a way that feels better or good to you. Right. Yeah. I think managing the emotion is the absolute first step to rewriting any narrative. And, and, you know, if it takes weeks, then it takes weeks, yeah. but, uh, that, that, that's the absolute, yeah, first step. Um, and you know, it's funny because y- y- you have a conversation with somebody, you have a relationship and y- you, meaning humans, <laughs> me, <laughs> um, me, you know, uh, we, uh, you know, she said this, she said that she made me so mad. I can't believe she did this bump, 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 you know, and that's your first attack, right? Or my first attack. <laughs> and then once I debrief, I realize I'm really not mad at her. I'm mad at myself. I'm mad at myself for not saying something or I'm mad at myself for saying something or I'm mad and disappointed that I wasn't honest and showing Mm -hmm. up with my true authenticity. Usually, at least for me, it's the feelings inside that are deeper that are require the inner dialogue and the inner work. And so that that all has to happen before you change, before I change anything and I rewrite a narrative, I've yeah. got to figure out what it was that went on inside me. That's so great. You know, I want to share with our listeners that um, at the point that we're recording this, we had just done a um, full moon fire with our circle here in uh, Richmond and Pixie's a part of that with me. And we focused on uh, working on releasing uh, victim, uh, victim, the role of victim and trying to elevate it or bring it forth in our life where we could see it more clearly. Because one of the things that I know, you know, that I see around me, that's so prevalent in our culture. And I think most people can relate to this is, is that the victim role is one that's sometimes consciously played out, um, to your advantage, uh, to used and misused as a way to manipulate people. And then it's also used very unconsciously as just habitual practices that we learned over time that we uh, learned through being in different environments where people behave that way and thought it was okay. And so, you know, the, 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 what Pixie was just talking about was the idea of doing the the self-reflection and the inner work of being able to get in touch with some of this stuff that may not be really readily conscious to us, but it comes up in how we feel and what we're saying. And I have a great example of this. Um, I think my I think my daughter would be okay if I shared this. She uh, just sent it out actually in an email on our Dharma collective. So she was realizing that at the end of every day, she was saying, I just, I didn't get enough done today. And she one day finally realized that she was saying it like really frequently. And she said to her husband, "Uh, do I say that a lot? And he said, "I, I think you might say it every day. And so she picked up on the fact that it didn't feel good. And she realized it also didn't sound very good that she was basically beating up on herself. She was, you know, mad at herself for not having a better day, whatever. And so she rewrote the script. Right. And so the end of the day now, right, she's got a new script going. I feel really good about what happened today. I accomplished a lot of things. And she also, on top of that, looked at what her plan of the day was and made sure it felt achievable. Right. So like, as we talk about this whole rewriting the script, these are some of the ways that we do it, right? And the beginning is really looking for like, where where are your markers that allow you to see it's time to rewrite the script, that you're going to feel better if you if you go ahead and take that work and, and make it happen, right? I love that. And I, it, you know, earlier when Pixie was talking, I was thinking about part of rewriting our script, right, or, or changing our narrative is 
is really that self-awareness of what is the role that we are playing and we choose to play. And I say choose. Sometimes we claim that another person is the reason we play the role we do. Right. right. Or put but us really, there. <laughs> right. Yeah. Really looking at how do we show up? What is the ro- role we're choosing to play? And um, and I love that you mentioned um, your daughter Cass's um, her, I guess, realization, which she did share with all of us in an email. If you follow her business, um, the Dharma Collective, mm-hmm. right, um, you would see that in her email this week. And but it reminds me also of when I was taking uh, the neuroscience of change co- coaching course that I did, and I rely so heavy on heavily on in my coaching, one of the um, the the I'll say coaches who led a module, he coaches about um, and he does this with clients. Three circles on the floor. One is the victim. One is the villain. One is the hero, and he asks his clients as they're telling him their story. You know, what is it they're bringing to coaching this week often is a story um, to step into the role that they are playing within the story. And I've done this practice myself, not with my clients, but with myself. And it's amazing how frequently we shift between the victim and the hero. We often don't recognize we are also the villain. Right. And so I love this in changing your narrative or at least bringing awareness to your narrative you know, start to pay attention to in any given experience, who are you in each moment of that experience? Right? Right. Yeah, I I love that, actually, because you can you can, you can switch very quickly from villain to victim to hero. Yeah. Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah. And um, when when this moon topic came up last full moon, the blue moon, Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 it really it boggled my mind and I concentrated on it for many, many days and learned a lot of where I end up playing the victim. And uh, I pride myself on never being a victim, uh, but no, it's, (laughs) it's, uh, it's very easy to, to play the victim. You know, I, I kind of want to mention one thing too. Um, there, there's a real science edge to rewriting the narrative. And I, I kind of want to bring it up mostly because, um, you know, we are controlled in large part by our mind and all these kind of neurons that fire billions of times a second. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, our mind holds every data point. It doesn't throw any out. Okay. Mm-hmm. So your entire your entire past is archived within this amazing supercomputer of a mind. And um, so it's something to be aware of because, Mm -hmm. um, you know, especially when you start to (laughs) self-sabotage, remember, remember you are human, you are, you have a human mind and that is composed of amazing neurological networks like, just think of it as kind of brain circuitry um, that releases these, you know, crazy cocktails of hormones and, and, um, and it's all there to protect you, you know, to, to kind of recognize a predictable experience and then um, manage it in the, in the easiest path. The brain always likes the path of least resistance yeah. uh, so it can preserve energy. It's mm-hmm. all scientific. And so it's easy for these neurons to say, oh, yeah, I remember that conversation with that friend uh, last week, the week before, the month before, the year before. It seemed to work, kept you mm-hmm. safe. Yeah, let's <laughs> do that again. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so I, it's just important to realize that Although that is a superpower, supercomputer, you also can change the paths. Their neurological paths are very neuroplastic or nimble. Mm -hmm. And so every time you do get conscious and you change your thought and you change your narrative and rewrite the narrative, uh, the brain gets into that neurological path. 
and what's fascinating, and I'll just end this kind of science. And I'm I'm sorry because every time I get on here, I talk science, but I can't help it. We love it when you talk science. <laughs> I'm a, I I can't help it. I'm a scientist. It's at my yeah. core. But <laughs> what's interesting about the brain is that the brain doesn't care if it's real or not. Yeah. The brain doesn't right. even it doesn't even know if it happened or not. So when you create or rewrite a narrative, the brain is reprogramming firing those neurons along that path it thinks it happened just like the phone call last week yeah that's powerful (laughs) absolutely so you know and, and i and i often tell my clients this that a belief is simply a thought we think again and again and again right and so going back to you know cass's um her her thought that she didn't get enough done in the in that day yeah having that thought i i didn't get enough done i didn't get enough done i don't get enough done you know that just wears that neural pathway right into your brain and really forms the belief yes that that you're someone that doesn't get enough done and so changing that whatever that is right i mean i did this in the 90s when i decided i I wanted to be an optimist. I did not see myself as an optimist, right? I purposely changed my thinking and created a version of me that is me today that I'm an optimist, right? That that it's amazing to think how powerful we can be with our own thoughts, right? So rewriting the narrative, shifting the script, you know, deciding the role we want to play, all of that ties into I'm going to say hijacking your brain yeah, so that you can create the life you want instead of your brain leading you to the safe life. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of people have a hard time with this because they're like, Oh, you're just fooling yourself. You're just making something up, but that's not really what we're advocating. No, Um, no. we're we're, glad you went there. I was going to go there. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're advocating truth and, and, one way, and I, I picked this up when Laurel was sharing her daughter's story, the way she was changing her thought or starting to, and this is always a slam dunk way to start, mm. is gratitude. And and so Cass decided that she was going to be grateful for what she did produce that day, what she did get done, what went well. And that's gratitude. And that's even if you could just start with one thing like, yeah. Well, wait a minute. You know, I had a really phenomenal conversation with a colleague at the coffee machine that that seemed to inspire her thought on such and such. I mean, that right there. Yeah. Is, this, yeah. And this is huge. I don't want to breeze by this one because I just had this conversation with a client recently and she was talking about, you know, we were talking about gratitude and incorporating it into your day. And especially when you're going through hard times and um, you know, and I said, so, you know, she was kind of describing how she did her gratitude. And I said, okay, so let's just take a pause right there. Right. Because gratitude, gratitude shouldn't, it, it, we don't want it to be a thing that we do at the end of the day that we hurry through and we make a list and then we're done. The g- point of gratitude, if you're going to have a gratitude practice is to actually take enough time in your experience to feel gratitude. You don't want to think about the things you're grateful for and make a list. You want to actually in that moment, bring up the feeling of feeling grateful for having had or experienced whatever it was. Because gratitude, when we think about, you know, this idea of abundance and um, changing our vibration, Gratitude has a very powerful vibration. And when we can change our vibration from feeling like a victim or feeling depressed by the day or feeling like we're not good enough because we didn't get enough done, and instead to one of feeling like, wow, that was really great. I feel so grateful to have had that experience. You are actually changing the state of your being. And Laura, yeah, I know I, we've talked about this, that yeah. it is rather than having a gratitude practice, it is practice gratitude, right? Right. It's an action. And it reminds me of even, you know, 
feeling grateful. I mean, in, in Pixie's example of a telephone call that, you know, you replay in your mind and you and your self-critic comes out and, and you know, um, evaluates every every word you might have spoken, right? Being grateful, feeling grateful in the mix of messy emotions that you might feel when that happens, feeling grateful that you have that experience or awareness or both maybe yes. the experience and the awareness to know that that's a human experience and you can choose how to do it better the next time, right? Yep. Um, even feeling grateful for having the learning opportunity. Yep. Oftentimes when crappy things happen and they do, right? I am really, I feel into the gratitude of the lesson in the experience. Yeah. So this, this has to lead into kind of my, the second part of what I think about all the time in my life. And again, you guys already know. Uh, so I always, I always come pretty quick to a science perspective, but then I move quickly to the spiritual and, mm -hmm. and, you know, the mind is truly along the science path. It's got a lot of uh, science kind of uh, uh, energetic controls, but it's uh, the heart. The heart is is what we need to let lead. Um, we need we need to let our heart train our mind. And I think about that all the time. I I actually say that to myself all the time. Come on, heart, train my mind because. Um, if you get into the gratitude and you get into the feeling part of every experience, every interaction, every conversation, um, that is what moves you basically to telling the universe what you want and who you are and who you want to be and what you want your life to look like. And, and, you know, it sounds dramatic, right? It sounds really dramatic. All we're talking about is a stupid conversation with a friend, but it's, yeah, it's, it's not. Weird. It's yeah. it's huge because yeah. when you take the time to first forgive yourself, have compassion for the human experience, and then you take the time to to feel all of that, work yourself through that, have compassion, and then you take the time to imagine what you're doing is you're connecting your energy to the universe mm -hmm. and you are attaching yourself to every single infinite possibility that the universe has to offer you mm -hmm. in that experience. That's when the heart takes over. Yeah. The mind is like in the back seat, in the back car of like a 55 car train. Yeah. And yeah. and that that back car on that train has no choice but to align itself literally with your desires and your universal backing. And that is what leads in the next opportunity. So this is great. Yeah. I, I love it. I, I, cause I feel like I, what I feel like we, we went into here, which I think is really lovely. And I want to, I want to, uh, bring it to this place is a lot of people are like, well, just fake it till you make it. And we're, we're, we're not saying that what we're saying is there is some creative part of you that knows how to show up differently, how to have a different kind of conversation. And what you're working is, you're working your imagination to connect with that creative part of yourself that can step into the role of hero, that can step into the role of strongly bounded woman, or, you know, that can step into the role of, um, you know, heroine, you know, with, with all the money in the world, right? Like we can, we can step into that space of embodying what that would feel like to be that part of us in that moment, right? It's not that we don't have that part, it's that part has not been well exercised. And so it's not a fake it till you make it, it's a rallying and connecting inwardly and creatively with a part of you that you might not be accustomed to connecting with all the time. Yeah. So true. And I, you know, I think about, um, it's a, you know, a back to the role, right? That we have, we each have the capability to be that version of ourselves, but it takes, I'll say, the awareness, the practice, the envisioning, right? I mean, I I coach a lot on, you know, 
the the visioning, vision your future and vision yourself because we're so accustomed to being the way we are today and how we are today is often tied to our past actions and behaviors, right? Because our brain, our brain keeps all of that, um, our tendencies and patterns. Um, are all stored in there. Right, all You're stored in, in there, there right? <laughs> and so we have that capacity to create that version of ourselves, but we really have to allow the space and and time to bring it forward, right? In a creative way. Yeah, yeah I, I have to add... Um, because I, I, I really want to make sure people don't think that we're, you know, when we say rewrite, that we're actually erasing. Um, right. And, yeah. and um, you know, this this rewriting the narrative is at any level you want to take it. It can be a phone conversation, but it can also be rewriting the narrative of your whole person. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way I, I give an example um we're, we're all we all come into this world with certain kind of tendencies right and I'm, I'm not gonna battle the you know the nature versus nurture <laughs> argument but but um but we all come in with some tendencies genetic tendencies and we also develop these coping strategies from day one and so we become certain people and 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 embrace certain powerful traits and so one of the traits for example that I have, uh, probably a, a an integration of of genes and and uh, and the way I was raised is I'm I'm a super strong independent person fiercely independent and and so that can be good and that can be bad right and so when it when it's used in certain ways or when it's based on maybe certain negative kind of things then it it, it's a weakness it it is it's a weakness but i can rewrite the narrative around that strong personality of trait of mine i can rewrite that and look at it as a beautiful thing that is an independent spirit and that it, it's not necessarily, you know, uh, where I'm super fierce, independent, craving, you know, uh, or in, in, enable to rely on other people. But it's I can take the narrative around that trait and use it for all the strengths that I can present to the world. Does that does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, yeah. This, the same thing with empathy. You know, I happen yeah. to be a really highly empathic, sensitive person. Again, uh, I don't know why, but um, that can be dangerous. That can be a negative thing. But if I rewrite that, yeah. I can I can hold on to that empathetic nature and use it as a gift. Right. In, instead of maybe making me a target for certain people or whatever. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's the, that's the part that we're talking about, you know, is like being able to see where you aren't comfortable in your life, right. Getting, getting more comfortable with seeing those as opportunities for you to change, right. To change your experience, to rewrite the script, to focus on what you, what you can do differently, Right. And not worry about the other person, because this is the other thing. You know, when you're rewriting the script, it's like you can make up a million ways that the other person is going to, you know, uh, respond. And you might miss the one that they actually say when you go to do it. Right. So you can only plan so much, but it doesn't you know, it's like the point is, yeah, but how do you want to show up and how do you want to feel right when you're showing up that way? And how can you speak your truth and stay connected to the place inside yourself where you continue to show up authentically, right? And whenever we do that, that's usually when we can walk away and go, that that felt pretty good. You know, it might have hurt. It might have been whatever, you know, it might have been something that was unexpected, but I said what I wanted to say. I was honest and true to myself and to the other person. And for that, you know, we usually walk away pretty clean. And that's, to me, that's the goal, you know? Yeah. What a great conversation. Such a great conversation. We could talk all day about this one. 
I know. Well, I think that, you know, uh, the the journaling uh, prompts, exercises, recommendations here are pretty obvious. I don't know if we have to say them, but, you know, we gave a great one of rewriting the script for yourself when you pay attention to your own self-talk that you recognize is detrimental to your uh, well-being, to your day, to your experience, You how to rewrite that a little bit. And then the the, the taking the time to go through and, and rewrite the dialogue, you know, with a, a conversation that you've already had. How do you want to say it differently? right and and to practice to really practice and practicing out loud is so valuable too i think we talked about that a little bit the last time um when we were here with pixie but it's just really you know to practice your tone to practice saying words that you might not usually say you know um yeah all of that is it's valuable yeah 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 so thanks pixie thanks for another great conversation oh i enjoyed it thank you yeah thank you All right. Well, we'll be back with Pixie again sometime, I'm sure. And thanks for being with us today. Get out there and rewrite your narrative. (laughs) Thanks. Bye for now. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.